Honorable delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Zahra Kareem, working at ComSats, Commission on Science and Technology for Sustainable Development in the South, and the host for today's webinar. First of all, let me send my gratitude to all of you for being here today with us, and a warm welcome on the behalf of ComSats, Center for Climate and Sustainability. So the webinar we're about to start is entitled to Industry 4.0 Driven Climate Smart Agriculture, the challenges and the opportunities for the developing countries. Also, we've asked the speakers to shed the light on the following topic, flag the challenges associated, bring on a new perspective to the table, and bridge how can we collectively implement Industry 4.0 Driven Climate Smart Agriculture. Now, it's my pleasure to step back and give the floor to the Executive Director Consat, Dr. Ghulam Mohammed Mehman, for his welcoming and opening remarks. However, due to the unavoidable uh, reasons, he couldn't join us, but we do have a video message that's going to be displayed or uh, that's going to be played shortly. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Pakistan. I am pleased to welcome you all to the webinar on Industry 4, Driving Climate Smart Agriculture, Challenges and Opportunities for the develop Developing Countries, being organized by the Comset Center for Climate and for Climate and Sustainability, representatives from the ICARDA, Lebanon, FAO, the Islamic Organization for Food Security Organization, Kazakhstan, National Agriculture Research Center, Jordan, and the Council for Scientific and Agriculture Research, Ghana, will be enriching the deliberations of this important event that would hopefully result in the useful discussions on the key topics relating to its theme. The event is especially important owing to its global significance, especially towards developing countries whose sustenance and development needs remains largely unmet. Climate change is happening faster and more devastatingly than the projections guided us. What lies ahead can already be foretold from the erratic weather patterns and more frequent and severe natural, natural disasters growing over recent decades. Amid the growing climate concerns, agriculture is likely to be the most vulnerable sector due to its reliance on the stable climate and weather conditions. This calls for exploring ways for making this sector more resilient through possible means, including strengthening social protection, revisiting agriculture policies, improving disaster preparedness, and most importantly, through due incorporation of smart processes and devices that are a hallmark of the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions. Smart agriculture has emerged as a new concept that simultaneously caters to the world's needs related to food security, environmental preservation, and economic growth, and serving all the three pillars of sustainable development. It is no surprise that the global smart agriculture market holds the promise of growing to US dollars, 36 billion by 2030. As we progressively recover from the early effects and challenges related to COVID-19 pandemic, it is crucial that we seize new opportunities that came along in the form of accelerated technological advancements across the physical, digital, and biological research and innovation spheres. This has expedited adoption of new tools and technologies globally like advanced sensors, artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, cyber security, drones, Internet of Things, augmented reality, virtual reality, 
cloud computing and robotics. The government is exploring ways to employ latest technological developments in the agriculture center, sector to enhance production, address food security needs of growing population, make necessary readjustments in food production to meet consumer preferences, reduce costs associated with various aspects of food supply chain and boost income of related stakeholders, as well as improve ecological footprint. Industry 4.0 serves as a backbone in implementing climate smart agriculture models and practices that address these challenges. Automation and control systems and big data analytical platforms have resulted in, the meaning, in a meaningful increase in the volume and diversity of the data related to agricultural production. Added by use of smart devices through local and worldwide wireless network infrastructures, precision agriculture provides viable means for achieving goals related to sustainable agriculture. This is good news that can be quantified based on the World Economic Forum report that suggests boost in the world's agricultural production up to 10 to 15 percent by 2030 with the adoption of precision agriculture by 15 to 25 percent of farms. This could also result in a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and water consumption by 10 and 20 percent respect, respectively, thus helping some key environmental and water security concerns. Comset has remained an ardent advocate of emerging technologies under its objective commitment toward SNT led development through international cooperation. This has been done over time with due involvement of key stakeholders, including innovation system actors, industrial, technological, and governmental. Comset serves as a platform for developing synergies and programs to coordinate high quality research and establish necessary institutional linkages. An important pool of resources available to the organization for such intervention is its network of center of excellence. The network currently comprises of 24 reputed R&D and S&T centers and higher education institutions that offers remarkable research and training opportunities for scientists, researchers, and students from the developing world. A focused group of these and other institutions has also transpired into WCS, thus that looks at more nuanced aspects of the sustainable development related to climate change such as the one reflected in this webinar's theme. The objective of the present webinar serves its theme well by way of helping enhancement of existing knowledge related to Industry 4.0 for climate smart agriculture, exchange of information on good practices, identification of the priority areas of climate smart agriculture, and creation of useful linkages. I hope that this webinar will result in better understanding and long-term cooperative ties among the participating individuals and institutions, fostering advancement in climate smart agriculture, aiding climate action on the whole. I wish you all a productive day. Thank you, sir. One quick reminder, please. This webinar is covered by YouTube, so you may use the links so that you can have this for later if you really want to have a quick picture. Also, you can use the comment box so that we can take your questions easily and deliver them to the experts. We will have the discussion at the end of the talks. 
Now, we do have registrations from 17 different countries, including um, across the region, including Asia, Africa, Latin America. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali Abusaba. Dr. Ali Abusaba is the Regional Director of Central and West Asia and North Africa, Consultative Group for the International Agricultural Research, as well as the Director for the International Center of the Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas. Dr. Abusaba is a strategic leader in the sustainable development, climate change advocacy, and agriculture regions in the global dry regions. His scope covers North Africa, Middle East, Sub-Haran Africa, Central and West Asia. In addition to being an active reformer, both within the consultative group for the International Agriculture Research, as well as the International Center of the Agriculture Research, he promotes the global scaling of the dryland agriculture innovations to improve the livelihood resilience of smallholder family farmers under climate crisis. Prior to joining, consultative group for the International Agriculture Research to head the International Center for the Agriculture Research in the Dryland Areas, he was the Vice President of the African Development Bank. Over to you, Dr. Ali Abusaba. Thank you very, very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak with this August uh, group uh, this morning. Um, I have actually a presentation, but uh, uh, the sharing of screen has been disabled. If that would be allowed, then it would be a lot more interesting if I'm able to show a few slides as I speak. Would that be possible to unlock the screen sharing part? Okay, uh, can you just like have, give us a few minutes to adjust and then we get back to you? Very okay, good. Can you, you can carry on. Okay. Uh, okay, I think the screen has been uh, uh, sharing has been now allowed. So thank you so much. Uh, you're able to see my screen in full. Yes, of course. Very good. So I think, uh, you know, as has been said, uh, we are going through a serious uh, climate change crisis that is widespread, rapid, and intensifying. And uh, uh, the human activities, of course, has been the, the main driver causing all of this. And also the human uh, uh, you know, kind are also the main uh, you know, group that is suffering from this negative impact of the climate change. Uh, limiting warming to 1.5 is probably not uh, you know, possible at this point in time. Uh, in this region of the world, we are actually uh, foreseeing that we would be heading towards a four degree warming scenario, which would have a far reaching a negative impact on the farmers uh, in the region and on livelihoods. But on the good side, uh, there are uh, important uh, smart farming technologies that could help uh, farmers in the region and across the world to cope uh, and adapt to these uh, negative climate. These uh, range from uh, technological tools uh, around uh, monitoring and sensors that are able to measure temperatures and, uh, and, and uh, you know, water uh, uh, across different locations. We have drone technologies. We have uh, very well-developed databases that is allowing scientists and, uh, you know, and planners to do proper planning, anticipate uh, changes and adjust the growing season. The, the problem with the climate change is not just the rising temperatures, is the change in the seasons, which makes it really difficult for the farmers to know when to plant, what to plant, and even when you adjust the planting, you're faced with many forms of insects and disease that makes it quite difficult. So leveraging technology and the available tools in uh, today's world is quite essential in uh, the coping uh, strategy. Uh, it's also important that there has been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, testing and piloting and still on, on very much small scale, this whole concept of vertical farming. This is a technology as you see, uh, you know, allows you to use limited space to uh, grow crops under controlled conditions with very uh, limited need for uh, resources, whether in the form of nutrients and also without soil. This has a huge potential to become an essential uh, part in the future. Uh, similarly, you have the integrated, uh, you know, aquaponic systems. Uh, uh, you all agree that we need to move to a more crop per drop, more value for every drop of water that is 
uh, you know, uh, mobilized. So being able to recycle the water through different uh, production cycles, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you do fish farming, you cycle the water, you grow crops, you use solar energy to power the system. All of this would be able to allow us to use more smartly these uh, uh, available resources on, on our planet. If you go to a bigger scale, uh, it's quite important to recognize the role of digital innovations to build uh, climate uh, uh, resilient agriculture across value chains. And that uh, uh, basically, as you all know, uses a multiplicity of measurements across different scales from the farm uh, to the landscape uh, to uh, you know, a region uh, to possibly even a continent where you're able to look at data and performance of crops and uh, performance of waters across different levels. And uh, it allows uh, policy and decision makers to do proper, proper and better planning for the use uh, you know, uh, of, these, uh, of these production uh, systems. <clears throat> uh, similarly, in the Gulf countries, we've been able to use digital technology and satellite uh, remote sensing to measure uh, and to map date palm growing, you know, monitoring the movement of uh, the red palm weevil, being able to look at uh, uh, you know, infestations, anticipate and manage uh, becomes a very, very important element especially in sparse, in, in spacious areas and desert conditions where mobility is already a key challenge and a major uh, bottleneck uh, for production. If you take this uh, to a more uh, far level, there has been a lot of tools developed, not within the CGIR, not only within ICARA, but across so many uh, organizations across the globe. And I think here I would like to emphasize the learning because all of them are working but I see a very limited exchange of information, limited exchange of learning among all of those. And I think this has become so critical uh, for us to be able to move and refine so that you're able to go to industrial level application and be able to produce those uh, technological tools at the right quantities and at the right scale for them to be economic, to be used at farm uh, levels. Uh, ICARDA is, uh, you know, in its own research, is using high throughput phenotyping uh, you know, platform where you're able to support your research on drought and heat uh, without necessarily, uh, you know, having to limit yourself to laboratory conditions by going uh, to the field. So in terms of industrial applications, there are certainly a lot that the industry can offer. Similarly, in the breeding programs, uh, the research uh, programs have been moving from uh, the conventional breeding, which takes you, you know, uh, up to possibly 10 11 years before you can have an improved variety, having to wait for different generations, different crossings to take place, to uh, what we call the speed breeding facilities, which simulates growing conditions for prolonged uh, periods and allows uh, you know, some of these crossings to take place, some of these uh, you know, seeds to move from one stage to another in a significantly lower uh, you know, time periods. We call it seed to seed in 60 days. And of course, you in those conditions, you're able to come up with an improved variety uh, within a period of almost three to four years at the very most, uh, cutting your breeding time capacity by almost more than 50%. Of course, under significant and severe climate change conditions, you cannot uh, and you cannot afford the luxury of having to wait 10 years before you come up with a technology that meets a particular uh, demand uh, by the farmers. I think it's important to recognize that in today's breeding programs, there is a lot more emphasis on the product profiling, what the farmer needs, what the private operators need, what the industry requires. So you're breeding for a purpose because the whole model of the past where you breed thousands of lines and be able to generate enormous amount of technology without necessarily targeting the purpose for which you're doing that is something we cannot afford to do under uh, the conditions on the planet uh, today. Uh, also, the role of agronomy. There has been a lot of emphasis on the generation of new technology, much less on actually how you manage your crop. So by focusing on better improvement of the crop management, when to apply fertilizer, how do you able to uh, identify the right amount of deficiency in the nutrients you're applying, uh, you're able to optimize your energy consumption, your soil health conditions, and you're able to optimize the water application you don't only generate higher incomes, you also are able to manage the resources on the planet in a much more responsible way, in a much more sustainable way. 
which is a major challenge for the planet for the next 30 to 50 years. Um, also the dimension of diversification, this whole model about wheat after wheat, rice after rice, or wheat after rice, or even monocropping in other areas is not good for the soil, it's not good for the income. It also makes uh, you know, uh, other agronomic conditions less uh, desirable. So uh, research evidence shows that there has been enormous uh, financial and economic benefits as well as uh, you know, benefits to the environment through adoption of a, a variety of rotation crops. For example, a lentil and onion, uh, lentil and quinoa, you know, lentil and beans, uh, has uh, been able to uh, uh, you know, improve significantly the farmer income when you're able to make those kind of combinations as opposed to uh, you know, a single uh, crop. Uh, last is the whole concept of integrated desert farming. I think with the increased temperatures, we're going to see more and more uh, larger areas of degraded lands, rising heat, rising temperatures. And this calls for uh, opportunities to explore and put under uh, valuation and economic use the vast uh, uh, areas of deserts that currently exist, but not converting them into vegetable farms, but rather looking at what grows best under those conditions, date palm, fig trees, cactus, all of these things are very important economic uh, you know, drivers in the dry regions and in the deserts, they consume less water. They are naturally tolerant to heat and, and, and high temperature and drought, but they can still be improved. And I think this whole idea about bringing them together within a particular integrating ecosystem, looking at also how you bring in the animals, uh, sheep and goat and camel, then also experimenting a lot with the new water management technologies Overall, there are significant opportunities for this integrated desert farming, which we are currently promoting in a very big way in North Africa and in the Middle East. In short, the take home message, and I'm going to be concluding with this slide, is that business as usual is no longer an option. I think that what we are seeing, both in terms of rising temperatures, degrading land, water scarcity, and also the change in climate and growing seasons, requires a very different model of engagement. This is why the CGIR has decided to come together. The intervention and support from a single center alone is not sufficient. You need to look at the aggregate and experience from across centers where you bring in the water, with the management, with the seed technology, with the forestry, with the tree, with the livestock, with the fisheries, and be able to look at the policy and bring all of these things together in support of the effort of the country. And here, I would like to emphasize the role of the universities and the national partners who are quite essential in making sure all of these things happen, happen in the right way, happen in a manner that responds to what the country priorities and the country demands are. And the CGIR at large and ICARDA in particular, we look very much forward to work with partners across the globe to advance the uptake of, agri of, agri of agriculture innovations to a much bigger scale for, the, for a better livelihood for all farmers across the globe. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali Abusaba. Distinguished guests, it's a pleasure and privilege to have here with us Dr. Zitouni Uldada. Dr. Zitouni Uldada is the Deputy Director in the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and the Environment at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, leading food and agriculture organization's coordination of climate change and energy work stream. Currently, he's the member of UN COP27 task team established by the UN Secretary General. Before joining food and agriculture organization, he was the head of technology unit at UNEP for five years, leading work on technology, climate change, renewables, and energy efficiency. Prior to such engagements, Dr. Uldada also worked for the British government, providing policy and technical advice on many areas, including food safety, environmental policy, climate change, energy policy, radiation protection, science and technology. Dr. Uldada, over to you. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation and, and for this introduction and greetings to everyone. It's my pleasure to, to join you on this important webinar uh, and to add some perspectives to um, the previous speakers, hopefully from a complementary angle. So thank you very much again for this opportunity. 
So obviously we're, we're going through um, so many overlapping crises. We have the, the climate change, the biodiversity loss crisis, COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, and they are all affecting food security. Um, and the world is unfortunately moving further away from ending hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. We're moving away from achieving the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and just um, recently, we published the state of food security and nutrition in the world, and we found that there are as many as 828 million people around the world who are currently undernourished. And the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed 150 million more people into hunger. And the latest intergovernmental panel uh, on climate change report on impact, adaptation, and vulnerability, and the line that climate change will increasingly undermine food security. And we have seen recently around the world how extreme weather events are becoming more frequent, intense, and severe, with agri-food systems being more affected. And the war in Ukraine um, is affecting food security um, and global markets with vulnerable people being the most affected. So for all these challenges, we must transform our agri-food systems to make them more efficient, more inclusive, more sustainable, and more resilient, not just to the impact of climate change, but to the various crises and shocks that I mentioned. And this has now become really more urgent than ever. And it was interesting, the previous speaker also said that we cannot continue business as usual, and, and I totally agree. We have to change our business model. We have to change our uh, mindset. And this is where I want to zoom in into the importance of climate smart agriculture. Uh, we have to, to be smart in how we interact with the environment overall because of the successive crises that, that I mentioned earlier, we have to be more innovative. We have to look at the new reality of climate change and sustainability that's become really critical. Now, climate smart agriculture is an approach. It's not a fixed set of practices because there is no one size that fits all. So it is an approach. And it's important to, to highlight that. Because from our experience in applying climate smart agriculture and supporting countries in different parts of the world to implement CSA, um, this is really important to, to, to highlight. And within this framework, we're talking about on the relationship between climate smart agriculture and the industry 4.0. An important point here is that CSA should be context specific. And it should take into account the local economic and local realities, including the social and environmental and climate change circumstances. So what is important we see in the implementation of CSA in this context uh, of technological innovation is the importance of building the innovative and the, the, capac the innovative capacity to enable access to better information and better data for, for decision-making. We also need to make sure that we have policies that are aligned, that they are coordinated. And we need to also make sure that the institutional arrangements are coordinated. Why? Because there are two important aspects for implementation here. One, which is to ensure synergy so we can maximize the, the impact and, and the co-benefits we're aiming for. And the second is to minimize or to avoid trade-offs. So aligning policies and coordinating institutional arrangements are absolutely critical in, in CSA's application and other policies and measures because of the importance of ensuring synergies and trade-offs. And we also have to make sure that we have innovative and flexible incentives and financing mechanisms for the, the application of technological innovation and climate smart agriculture. For, for CSA approach, as I mentioned earlier, that is context specific, 
the aim of what we have in, been applying uh, at FAO in supporting countries is to enhance the capacity of the agricultural systems to support food insecurity, food security, and to incorporate the need for adaptation and the potential for mitigation into sustainable agricultural development strategies. And the other important goal of the approach is to have more integrated approaches to the closely linked challenges of food security, development, and climate change. And also the recognition that the implementation of options of CSA would be shaped by country uh, specific context and capacities, as I mentioned earlier. And the overall goal, obviously, is to contribute, to help countries, to support them, to contribute to the achievement of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, uh, including the nationally determined contrib contribution in improving them. So the point I want to, to make here really is, is the, the importance of maximizing synergies and minimizing or, tra or avoiding trade-offs. To give the importance to the efficiency through the application of CSA and innovative technologies, particularly the efficiency of um, the use of water and nutrients and energy. And collaboration is really critical here because as you know, global, uh, climate change is, is, is a global problem that needs really global collaboration. And regional collaboration is, is key because there are many aspects that are common to many regions, many challenges, and many, many solutions that can be found. So it's collaboration between regions and particularly the importance of South-South and tribal collaboration. And it has been proved in many settings, and I think it needs to be scaled up. So just to, to, to finish, um, we have obviously COP27 coming up and COP28 as really two main opportunities to address various interlinkages between some priorities and particularly in the context of applying climate smart agriculture. And that's to look at the interlinkages between food security, energy security and water security. And I think the regions where the COPs are going to be held will definitely highlight these, these priorities as being local and regional, but also they are common in other parts of the world. As we have seen now recently, the drought affecting even parts of the U Europe where it never happened before and where many European countries have declared drought as, as being um, you know, applied in, in many regions. And just to, to, to finish, it is important obviously to look at the application of climate smart agriculture and technical innovation measures as contributing to rural development. And the aim here is to achieve better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life for everyone, leaving no one behind. So thank you again for this opportunity. I hope that my points have added some complement elements, complementary element to what the previous speakers have said. And I really look forward to, to hearing about the outcome of this webinar and the way forward. Thank you very much again for the opportunity and back to you. Thank you, Dr. Zituni Uldata. We are hoping to have you for the discussion at the end of the talks. I, I'm happy, thank you. I'm happy to, to stay in for, for a while. As I said, I have a, a dentist appointment, unfortunately, at the end, but I'll stay as much as I can. I really look forward to any questions or discussions with pleasure. Thank you. Sure. We'll send you the questions through the email. Thank you so much. Now, thank, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ismail Abdul Hamid. Dr. Ismail Abdul Hamid is the Director of Programs in the Islamic Organization for Food and Security, Kazakhstan. Prior to such engagements with Islamic okay. Organization. Okay. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay, good. I hope that I can now. Uh, yeah, share my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for Comsat. Thank you for uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Ismail uh, Abdul Hamid. I'm the uh, director of programs and the project office. 
in the Islamic Organization for uh, Food Security. And um, I will uh, give a presentation about the, uh, based on IFS strategy, strategic uh, programs based on uh, the water and, uh, and the, uh, um, and, and an overview uh, of the climate change and resilient and water management related uh, activities. Um, in, the, uh, in the outline in uh, presentation in our, uh, in our program, that I would like to, uh, to give you a, a brief presentation about how IOFS program activities uh, is going and the, the uh, Islamic Organization for Food uh, security, uh, climate change resilient, and water management related uh, programs we have here in um, in our headquarters. We are in Nur Sultan, the Republic of Kazakhstan, and we will talk also about water agriculture and food security. And we will give uh, a, a point about the IOFS recent activities to uh, support the climate resilient agriculture in OIC member country and IFS blend activities to support the climate resilient agriculture um, uh, as well. Uh, as you know, uh, that Islamic Organization for Food Security, it is a uh, specialized institute uh, belonging to um, organization of Islamic cooperation. And we are having this key program, but we, we have to, to give um, just a very brief about what we are facing in our agriculture system. So uh, the main issue for uh, food security is that we have insufficient food supply or disturbed by a crisis or pandemic or whatever it is. And we are taking all this into highly consideration as well as all the globe taking now. And we are talking about the member countries of OIC that uh, uh, their industry under utilization regarding the food and the agriculture uh, system. And we are uh, also tackling the challenge of financial inaccessibility for supporting the food security and a sustainable uh, food system. Uh, we are uh, so much concerned about the climate and natural uh, resource uh, crisis and the, the uh, for instance, the greenhouse gas emission and food waste uh, is also uh, we taking care into our uh, programs. Uh, we need to uh, to also uh, we have to face the uh, the challenge of not utilizing the bio agri technology and the opportunities and the external uh, dependencies. Uh, unhealth, unsafe and even uh, of food and even the uh, lack of availability of both uh, co high quality and the nutrition food is also uh, our concern. This is why we have a uh, uh, 16 program and based, uh, based on five, they are all allocated under five pillars. We are in IFS uh, focusing in all our uh, work. Um, I will not go in details for our 16 programs. Maybe um, I have to focus in the uh, food governance resilient. And we are in this, uh, uh, we, in this program, we have also uh, another one for uh, building the uh, talent and the to, uh, capacity of uh, all the people working in agriculture sector for how can they make governance in food security and of course, to mitigate the climate change in agriculture. And in this regard, I will talk that we are not doing our uh, program standing alone, but we have all in our program, we know uh, that we have a partner with us. Um, and let me uh, tell you that uh, the uh, mitigation, mitigating the climate change in agriculture, we are also uh, con contacting and we have a partnership with the a different perspective from a governmental point of view, from uh, um, partnership uh, with, uh, with the uh, private sector, and of course, with other colleagues in the uh, international organizations in the regional and international uh, uh, perspective. Um, so the, we are all working for our member countries and uh, uh, IOFS, we have, uh, 
We used to have 36 member countries from the 57 of OIC, but now we have 37. We are honored to, to announce that the uh, chat have also joined IFS, and this is, um, uh, it was a great news for us lately. And now we are uh, um, going to face the uh, talk a little bit about uh, IFS climate change resilient and water uh, management related programs that we have. So if we talk about the um, uh, agriculture with the 75% of our fresh water uh, using in this sector, so, and it is totally affected by climate change. So we are focusing in tackling the, uh, the really the end user, small scale farmers, and how can we give them the know-how technology of improving the way the using the, the water in agriculture especially uh, just uh, as we heard in, uh, in the last uh, uh, lecture, it is a, uh, really all related about uh, improving the irrigation system and improving also the capacity of the small scale farmer to use the water in agriculture. And of course, uh, we all know that managing agriculture, water in agriculture, it is not only a, um, or, 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 or uh, it needs also a strategic plan uh, related to uh, our uh, efforts uh, with the, our partners and also uh, the governments. Uh, so we are also, uh, we have our own uh, water management, management in agriculture uh, system. I will talk about it in our in next uh, slides. We are also um, interesting so much about the gene banks and how the gene bank can uh, be a backbone for a, um, for our and the treasure for us in among the OIC member countries for uh, be standing with the um, the unexpected effect of uh, climate uh, change and the climate impact. So uh, without it, um, without gene banks, we could not work enough, and we could not even uh, think of uh, a, a food security and the resilience. In this regard, I have to uh, appreciate the uh, CGAR if it is on this regard. And uh, I have to congratulate our uh, colleagues in ICARDA for announcing the new capacity of Gene Bank, which is uh, also giving us in, and all our region the way forward to, to have access for uh, all this important uh, for us as agricultural specialists, we know how much we need all these uh, varieties. Uh, we have also ICPA, they have uh, this uh, work. And in, in IFS, we have uh, 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 also a complementary mandatory uh, uh, for uh, developing the gene banks in our governmental uh, level. And we have already adopted the Dubai Declaration, which announcing that the need of uh, raising the capacity of our member countries on this regard. It was an IOFS uh, and the government of the uh, United Arab Emirates. So, and it was uh, really um, a very good document that we can start. And then we built our uh, uh, continuous efforts for training with the um, with the Republic, Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So we had last year a, a, um, a series of training with the, for all the people working on the uh, mand mandate of gene banks and to raise their capacity. And uh, also this year we have a physical uh, training in Tunisia. Very soon we will have one in Turkey. And uh, later uh, this year we will have another training on uh, ICBA. And um, and we will we will uh, going on on this in this uh, developing, and and let me let me uh, try to just uh, telling you that um, it is it is a, just three years from now. Uh, most of our um, population in OIC will be living in um, uh, in water stress. Uh, countries and uh, this is uh, we have to uh, to uh, think again for how can we cooperate to this mitigate. I need to just to tell you the very important issues about the activities of Firefest towards this one. So we have um, uh, we have with the 
uh, with the help and partnership with the Islamic Developing Bank, we had a, uh, a training workshop for the uh, Central Asian uh, country and also this was physical and uh, African countries in the water to see the new technologies that have been developed by the hand of the uh, Kaznaro University in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and they uh, gained this hand of uh, training on this uh, part. And uh, again, in Niami, Niger, we had also training for the uh, small scale farmers for irrigation and this more than 60% of the participants were actually from the women working in agriculture, small scale farmers. And the most one of the most important initiative also we have started here in, in IOFS and it is, uh, it is the uh, integrated water uh, management uh, program in the Sahel region. And we had this with the uh, sales cooperation. We have this with the uh, other partners in our uh, uh, member countries, and of course, in Niger. And here you can see also the uh, Eurospace technology in Kazakhstan and the uh, uh, and the country uh, and the company for ICCT um, uh, uh, technologies. They are working on uh, in Dubai for um, uh, improving the water and how we can analyze in climate uh, change. Um, uh, I don't think I, uh, I exceed my time, but uh, we are going to uh, also uh, have, um, as I mentioned, we, have, we are going to participate in Cairo Water Week in a side event for policymakers in water in agriculture. And we are going to uh, have another uh, uh, round of training uh, for water and irrigation in Central Asian country. And uh, we will also um, uh, going to promote the uh, other alternatives for those have been developed in Jordan and in Iqba for hypo, hypo, hydroponic technology and how can we use it in the uh, as the, uh, as the theme for mitigating the agriculture, uh, uh, water deficiency in uh, agriculture. So um, we all our programs, it is, uh, it is available for cooperation for all of you. Uh, contact me at, at any time and you can uh, really, uh, uh, IOFS is going with the uh, stretch hand for the partnerships with all our colleagues who think that the food security is a mandatory for all of us and the water and the mitigating the climate change that we were talking about for centuries that climate change is coming, climate change is coming, and now we are in the middle of the climate change and we are now facing the same problems hand on hand and we are, uh, um, we, we will be uh, always welcoming for any kind of uh, cooperation. Um, I left my, my uh, contacts for any time and I'm always available for uh, partnership and thank you very much indeed. Salaamu Alaikum. Thanking Dr. Ismail Abdul Hamid for his enlightened words. Without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Stephen Yabo. Mr. Stephen Yabo is Senior Research Scientist in the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, Crops Research Institute, Ghana. Mr. Research has con Mr. Stephen has conducted extensive research in the areas of environmental, soil nutrient, and crops resource management on variety of crops to improve an understanding of the plant's responses to the environment with the focus of soil plant water relationship, climate smart agriculture for crop production, and the environmental quality priorities. Dr. Stephen Yabo, over to you. Yeah, please, can you enable me share my, my, my slides? I have some few slides to present. Good morning once again. Yeah, so uh, I want to add my voice to the current discussions on climate change and its effect on our people. As all uh, speakers have acknowledged, the effect of climate change is now with us. We've spoken about it for many years, and now the, the reality is done on us, and what can we do to resolve the issue? 
So I'm speaking from the context of West Africa. I'm uh, in Ghana now as a senior research scientist with the National Research uh, Institute for Council for Scientific and Industrial, Industrial Research. Now we understand that we need to increase food production as indicated by previous speakers, but the increase in food production must occur by using resources more efficiently. I think we all acknowledge that we need to use the current land, water, all the natural resources we, we have must be used in the context of friendliness, environmental friendliness, so that we don't destroy the environment. So more food in quantity, quality, and diversity, but this must be done using more uh, resources efficiently. And then what, how do we achieve this? I think that the way to do to increase resilient food system to change and, and the shops. So what is the focus of CSA in our part of uh, the world? We are looking at a CSA which uh, can improve productivity, will improve import input use efficiency. So the three main pillars which are productivity, adaptation, and mitigation. This is the main focus of climate change and then climate smart agriculture interventions in Ghana. So with that, what kind of things are we doing to promote and scale up CSA practices, which we acknowledge that must be context specific, must align with the social dynamics of the people, the economic status of the people must be taken into consideration. So I agree perfectly with uh, Dr. Sly when he mentioned that CSA is an approach, it's not fit for all, one fit for all, so it should be context specific. So in the case of uh, Ghana and then in most West African countries, one approach that uh, we are using in terms of uh, industry 4.0 driven climate smart agriculture is the establishment of national ag data hub uh, projects. So we acknowledge that we need to develop very dynamic user-friendly integrated systems that can facilitate data access because data is very important in making decisions. And then the right decisions are very critical in minimizing risk associated with climate change. So several data hubs are being established in many of West Africa countries, including Ghana. And the essence is to serve as a repository of all agriculture related data, climate change data, and they make be accessible to all stakeholders in respect of uh, geographical locations. So that with this, you can easily make the, uh, uh, decisions in mitigating or adapting the shocks or effect of climate change. So in this poster, in this data hub, as we all know, we have information related to the crop. You get site specific information, you get regional level information, and then all this will help in informing and making decisions, even if we are not in the country. So we have uh, Ag Data Hub, where we think that capacity building and partnership is very integral because currently, for example, we are building Ag Data Hub which also has a replica effect on what Nigeria wants to do. So we need a, a regional integration to be able to get something like a regional ag data hub because Ghana is building, Mali is building, Nigeria is starting to build a national ag data hub of agriculture info to provide agricultural information to people to make decisions. So we have database development, data quality control assurance, management the data and make it fully operational, data analysis. And I must acknowledge that a lot of capacity is required in making this system very functional and then sustainable. Now, one other thing in terms of industry 4.0 driven climate smart is the internet of things in agriculture. We acknowledge the, the essence of web-based information in making climate, uh, making climate decisions. So currently there is a lot of emphasis on the use of IoT in making a, a climate smart and monitoring crop yields, which is very important. So we have size specific agriculture practices that monitors even local air quality and yield because we understand all this has influence on crop yields. So we have, we need to increase crop yields, not compromise environmental quality. So we have an IoT that has been fitted in various agricultural landscape and then in various cropping system landscape 
where uh, we monitoring soil uh, air quality in the various fields to be able to determine the effect of our practices. So although you have recommended a CSA practice, what is the effect in terms of air quality of the, uh, of, of the environment? So nearby communities and households are also uh, screened. The air is also screened for quality. And all these are very important in minimizing the effect of the current upset in climate change. Empowering institutions and then end users is very critical in this, in this, in this uh, direction. So we are connecting various digital platforms with farmers through using participatory approaches or in help, helping scale up various CSA bundles to make informed decisions by, 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 by the populace and by people even not within the country. So we have various forecast platforms we have agroclimatic committees, agroclimatic bulletins, participatory climate uh, services called PISA, and various softwares that are used to make climate information services available to the people. So we have various mobile and web-based web tools for enhanced CSA decision-making processes. So climate data, crop uh, 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 predictions, and all that help in minimizing risk associated with climate change. So cr critical examples can be found online. If you look at the ISOCO. ISOCO is a technology platform which uses a combination of mobile and web services to improve access to extension services and, and market information. All these are being carried out in the nation as a, as a CAC interventions to help adaptation climate change and all the issues associated with climate change. Also, we have mobile devices that gives information on uh, pests and disease, as mentioned earlier on, information on weather forecast, and then help people make decisions and predict what is likely going to happen. Uh, these are call centers established where people can call in to get climate information. Uh, people can call in to seek clarification in terms of uh, forecast, people can call in to seek clarification on what is, is, what is coming up and what is available. So we done national surveys to, to determine the use, usefulness of this CSA information to farming communities. And then we have all these partnerships and responsibilities at the national and then at the local level, uh, administrative uh, levels. Now I want to share with you what are the enabling policy environments and then capacity building options that are very important in industry 4.0 driven uh, uh, climate smart agriculture. We think that we have to advocate for public private investment in eco innovation technologies. This is very critical because these are technologies that can cut across regional boundaries. So we think that currently technology development should not be national centered. It should be it should cut across regions and cut across private and public institutions. Then we need to make technical input to policy development, advocate for support for research capacity building that contribute to environmental sustainability, build capacity of actors on eco innovation value chain, and then give technical backstopping to CCD actors and other stakeholders. This this points I think will provide very sound enabling environment for scaling industry 4.0 climate smart agriculture interventions and social technical innovations that have been developed in the various countries and across the region. We will must work with national cultural research institutions as mentioned earlier by Dr. Udada that all these research partnerships are very critical and are very integral in making great successes. Now, what is the challenge? The challenge is that with respect to industry 4.0, climate smart agriculture, in, in, in our context, low to middle income end users, especially farmers, usually have limited access to climate smart agriculture recommendations or tailored climate information services. As indicated by the previous speakers, the CSA must be tailored it should be within the social context and then the economic uh, uh, status of the people. And these are all low. 
capacity of institutions in the deployment of technology-driven CSA is also limited or inadequate, then access to mobile phones and internet services is also limited, and the financial input supply services are also limited. So these are the critical challenges that uh, hinders Industry 4.0, climate smart agriculture, upscaling, and innovations in our part of the world. But what are the opportunities that is available? The opportunities, as we have all uh, acknowledged, to is the increasing impact of climate change on various households and on the people. And this is a challenge, but it provides us the opportunity to think through at the regional and then inter intercontinental level to find solutions and the context specific solutions to mitigate and help the people adapt to the impact of climate change. Increasing access to mobile phones, we know the internet penetration in Africa is increasing, which is a good news, and that provides us further opportunities for all the interventions we are talking about. And then there is also enhanced collaboration between the public and private sector, which doesn't used to exist in many parts of Africa. And this also provides very strong opportunity for us to enhance our, our, our network. They will also talk about strong network of public and private sector actors. And then we have awareness and multiplicity of CSA in the house across the region. Uh, in our view, these few points provide very good opportunities for us to drive climate smart agriculture in Africa and in developing countries. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to make this contribution. This is my village in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sipin Yahabo. I have the privilege to introduce Dr. Maram Jamil Abe. Dr. Maram Jamil Abe is climate change specialist and drought monitoring researcher at National Agriculture Research Center, Jordan. Additionally, she's studying urgent problems of ragelands, field survey, RS and GIS analysis in Jordan. In addition to that, she's developing a combined drought index all over Jordan, and she's also monitoring the hotspots that are prone to drought in her PhD research. Her research in the following area allowed her to further develop and strengthen her understanding to the environmental issues, her experiences, communication, and interpersonal skills. Dr. Maram Jamil Abe, over to you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the ComSat uh, Center uh, for Climate and Sustainability for uh, inviting me for such an important uh, webinar and take part and talk about the opportunities and challenges in the climate uh, change uh, mitigation and resiliency. Uh, and uh, share thoughts with uh, the scientists from Lebanon, Kazakhstan, uh, Italy, and Ghana. Uh, before that, I want to say that in our organization, the National Agriculture Research Center, we invest in the agricultural uh, re research, and uh, whether it's locally derived or uh, adopted from other resources, in order to maximize the plant and the animal production, which is reflected in the food security and the food sufficiency all around Jordan. And allow me to share my presentation. Today I will talk about the climate smart agriculture challenges uh, and opportunities. Uh, in Jordan. Um, first of all, as we all know that climate smart agriculture was presented and defined uh, by FAO in the Hague Conference on Agriculture 2010, that contributes to the achievement of sustainable development goals. And uh, to integrate dimensions of sustainable uh, development, economic, social, and environmental jointly addresses uh, for food security and the climate. The climate smart agriculture, as we all know, that it has three main core objectives. The sustainability increase in agricultural productivity and to help agriculture communities to adapt to climate change. And furthermore, to reduce or remove greenhouse gases, whether it is possible. 
as we all know that uh, climate change, the climate is changing and it's not deniable. The climate change prevents and presents a critical challenge for global food security. And as you can see between now and 2050, the world's will, population will increase by one third and most of these additional two billion, unfortunately, are in the developing countries. So for that, the agricultural production will have to increase by 60% by 2050 to satisfy the expected demands for food and feed. And unfortunately, on the other hand, climate change will make this task more difficult under business as usual scenario without doing an action due to the adverse impacts of agriculture recurring, spiraling and adaptation related costs. The women and men that are responsible for our food production, the farmers, the herders, the fishers, they are hit by the hardest of the consequences of the climate change. So the climate smart agriculture heightens the productivity in an environmentally and socially sustainable way and strengthen farmers' adaptation and resilience to climate change and supports mitigation efforts. But the farmers are not alone in this uh, process. The policymakers are crucial and they can make climate smart reality by demonstrating political commitment, formulating a country strategy for climate and creating enabling environments. They have to sit all on one table and negotiate what, what, what they are doing for our future. Now I want to concern on my country, homeland, Jordan, as a developing country. What are the challenges that we can do it? We are facing and we have to convert it into opportunities. Jordan has a lot of, cha has a lot of challenges. As you can see, Jordan is a very small country with not more than 90,000 square kilometer. And unfortunately, 90% of this area is arid. And uh, regrettably, Jordan is ranked among the most water scarce country globally, along with its nearly all its neighbor. You can imagine that Jordan is receiving in some parts less than 50 millimeters, and uh, the maximum is 450 millimeters yearly. And unfortunately, about 92% of Jordan's rainfall evaporates. And from the demographic side, we have more than uh, 10 million population, and Jordan is the second uh, host country in the world for the refugees, especially the Syrian refugees, after the last conflict in their homeland. And moreover, climate change is a, is a harsh uh, impact on Jordan. As you can see here, Jordan is facing harsh climate changes that affect agricultural production. And these challenges are expected to worsen in the coming years. Climate will place a pressure in Jordan's water resources and adversely affect agricultural production through water scarcity, higher temperature, and more frequent and extreme events. As you can see in the two maps that we have here, by 2030, an increase in the temperature will be happened, the projected changes in the annual mean temperature and the total precipitation in Jordan is worsened. But what have Jordan to do for, for uh, the impacts of the climate change? They are trying to make climate smart agriculture, which offers opportunities and adopt and mitigate the impacts of this climate change while promoting continued growth and job creation. So Jordan tried to do a national climate policy that is in alignment with the international commitments and they assesses the priorities and invested investment packages based on their potential contribution to the climate smart agriculture, which is a greater efforts are needed to mobilize Jordan climate smart agriculture action plans opportunities for climate financing from both public and private sector. This, uh, this is a national economic growth plan uh, strategy in Jordan that it has laid out of several objectives, uh, alignment with the SDGs and the Millennium 
development goals that hold great potential impact for rural agricultural livelihoods. These include balancing production and consumption for hitting the SDG 12 and doubling the economic growth and the job opportunities by hitting the SDG 8, promoting industry and innovation, improving energy security, affordability, and eliminating hunger and poverty. Although the impact of economic growth plan is not evident in Jordan, but Jordan has generally demonstrated strong progress and expects to achieve the SDG 2 by 2030. Nevertheless, the crisis of the Syrian refugees, the stagnating national growth, and the COVID pandemic, as we all know, and the contaminant increase of investment needs have posed significant uh, threats on continued growth in Jordan goals. These are the circumstances that the agricultural areas in Jordan has and the agricultural production is facing. The agricultural area is not more than 4.5%. The crop production area in Jordan has been extraordinarily volatile over the past 40 years. As you can see, the main uh, crops produce vegetables, olives, and fruits. The livestock sheep uh, are in a very small quantities. The self-sufficiency is of vegetables, olives, fruits, eggs, and milk and dairy. All that drastic changes uh, in productivity have important implications uh, for domestic food security and interna international trade. So Jordan heads to investment opportunities in the agricultural sector, transition to climate resiliency. Let's have a look about this investment opportunities in Jordan. We have a high value date palm development as one of the previous speakers had talking about the palm development, processing and marketing using modern irrigation, improved cultural practices and in the uh, irrigated area. On the other hand, the expansion of upgrades, protected vegetables production with advanced technology processing and marketing options in the irrigated areas. And after that, the investment opportunities in the agricultural sector emphasize on the olive production and processing through low cost modern technology and collaboration of cold pressing and pickling and the alternative waste uh, use of rain fed areas. Enhanced barley production through rainwater harvesting and improved management in rain fed areas in the Badia, which is the desert part of Jordan. Mm -hmm. Regarding the elevated small remnant production through intensive farming systems and dairy chain development in agro pastoral areas. And on the other hand, Badia restoration with micro catchment, water harvesting schemes, and improved grazing management in agro pastoral areas. In summary, Jordan is a promising environment for investment in the climate smart agriculture with more funding and more institutional coordination among ministries and between public and private sector. The success of this investment in the climate smart agriculture will be measured through various activities that need to be implemented to establish necessary outputs and it's necessary to monitor and establish relevant indicators at the portfolio and individual investment levels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maram Jamil Abe. Now we'll proceed towards the discussion session. And my first question is for Dr. Maram Jamil Abe. How is collaboration in between public and private sector regarding the application of CAS policy? Dr. Mariam, am I audible to you? Thank you. This is a very crucial question. The private sector in Jordan has made many important investments in date palm, but strong potential remains for private sector involvement in other areas such as financial service. 
this sector includes exporters, input traders, and farmers group. So the involvement of this private sector is somehow in Jordan um, needs to, to collaborate with the public uh, environment and uh, the, pr the private sector activity in Jordan remains far below the ecological zone, is focused on how higher in the irrigated agri-ecological zone and includes imports, imported inputs such as sapling fertilizers. But to, uh, to, to achieve the food security, we, we have to uh, set in one table the private and the public sector, and there is a we, we have to have a very strong uh, coordination between the ministries and the other private uh, investment sector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miram. One of our past participants has a question. Over to you, Ms. Farhana. Um, hello, everybody. It was a pleasure listening to you and congratulations to all speakers and uh, uh, my fellow colleagues to have put together this wonderful event. I have, uh, uh, I have been following this event over YouTube and it was an excellent learning. And uh, my question would be to anyone who feels uh, that they uh, fit the bill to answer this question. It is basically to do with uh, IGOs, regional organizations, and their role in helping put to place the CSC strat strategy, especially at operational level. Um, if I be more specific, I'm talking about farmers' role in implementation. And as we know, industry for open to, uh, depends greatly on technology and smart innovation which may or may not be available to the farmers or may, may not meet their cadre or educational or innovation savviness. Uh, so to, to put it simply, um, what role uh, do you think IGOs or regional organizations could play in this regard with respect to farmers' education, especially considering that there are a number of small, small holding farmers in developing countries specifically, which are our focus around here how to integrate them considering that they are the most crucial link to this chain how uh, to cater to the education training needs to make them uh, adopt all uh, the end products and end processes related to uh, this industry for open food driven agriculture considering that not all farmers have access to the right information or tools anyone Please take this question. Thank you, Ms. Yeah, Benana. Yeah. I would like to put this question to Dr. Ali Obisaba. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I think it's, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, tools that are available today based on today's technology and outcomes of 50 years of research require a very integrated uh, you know, collaborative model that brings all stakeholders together, including private operators, farmers, uh, because you know, they are really at the center of all of these things. Research you know, works in laboratories, in research farms, in fields, but the only way you can have impact at scale is in farmer fields. So without the strong engagement of farmers and without the strong engagement of the private sector to take this thing to farmer fields, uh, we are not going to succeed. So that's, that's what really I believe should be the model for the future. Thank you, Dr. Ali Musaba. Dr. Stephen, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I so I, yeah, I want to add something to this. I think that uh, Dr. Liu said it right. The impact of all innovations is at the community level, is at the end user level. How much the end user is able to adapt to the technology results in the impact that we all seek for. So I think one of the models of this uh, uh, scaling should be 
basically public private partnership as indicated in my in my presentation we the public sector cannot do it alone neither can the private sector so the two there should be appropriate engagement strategy to bring together the public and then the private sectors in this form so we can have the maximum impact at the community level that we all emphasize thank you Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Dr. Maram, you were intruding previously. Would you like to add something now? Yes, I want to add something from our um our work at the National Agricultural Research Center, we have uh, too many success stories with the farmers. First of all, we have an application on their phones that we can uh, give them the, the research results and the, uh, the, any answer for them for their laboratory tests for uh, doing uh, uh, this and that uh, based on the climate and uh, the weather. Uh, on the other hand, we have a platform for the farmers. Uh, we can uh, teach them by what we call climate-oriented uh, farmers field school, that our researchers go to the farmers and uh, learn them how to use uh, this application, how to, uh, to adopt the new technologies uh, in the agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miram. One of our participants would like to add something over to Mr. Farhan. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Farhan Ansari. I'm working at Search headquarters. My question is again to any of the panelists who would like to answer it, especially to the representative of FAO if he's still there. Uh, it relates to the economic uh, impact or the cost of the CSA approaches. Because as we know that when we deviate from the existing practices or existing infrastructure, there's an added cost, especially in the initial phase. And this sometimes becomes unbearable for the small uh, farmers, even for the small companies in the developing countries uh, where uh, there are, uh, you know, resources are already scarce. So any take on, on this on how can international organizations or the governments of these countries uh, support the farmers and small companies and in, in uh, making this transition? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farhan. Um, any speaker would like to add anything? You're more than welcome to do so. Uh, I'd be happy I can to, try. to answer oh, this question, no, no, perhaps. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I may start and, and then you can, you can add a few points. Um, thank you for these questions. Um, it, it, it's so important that um, you know we're aware of the fact that you know the smallholder farmers obviously shouldn't bear the economic costs because what we're trying to do is to support them rather than put burdens on them, and this is linked also to to the first question. You know when we talk about CSA approaches and having tools or applications, I don't think that all the smallholder farmers need that. And, and that's something that we need to, to consider. When we talk about education, it's more about really support with information, with data, with something that can be useful to smallholder farmers to increase productivity and income. These are the main things really. So the point I'm making here is that we shouldn't think that tools or applications are going to be applied across the board that everyone needs that because there are smallholder farmers who just need that support, as I said, to increase the, the productivity, to be resilient enough to ensure that that's productivity. Uh, and that's the, the, the point I want to make. You can think about you know, water uh, harvesting, for instance. There are a number of things where support is needed for that particular context. And that's the message I was making through my, my intervention initially. We shouldn't think about a tool, a an approach that can be applied across the board. There are various differences in circumstances, in capabilities, and in needs. That's why be careful in what we say, tools and applications. Thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe I could just add uh, something before I drop. Unfortunately, I have to leave. Uh, is the question uh, about... Uh, 
the role of government and making sure that you put in place the right incentive. So we know a lot of governments across the world provide some form of subsidy, whether to farmers, to producers, to traders, to the economy at large. So the question is to have a high uptake, it's very important to look at how you could redeploy and redesign some of these policies so that you are able to challenge any support to farmers or to, uh, uh, to the people in a way that would put in place the right incentive for these technologies to be taken up at scale. So I think as we discuss, technologies are important, but the role of policy here is key. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali Abusaba, for being here today with us. Uh, Dr. Ismail, would you like to add anything? We have received another question. To facilitate the adoption of CAS practices and the technology, which policy intervention you see more important are needed and what are the capacity development needs? If anyone would like to pull in. Well, in the absence of interest, I can just come can in. I, can I, I, can I, okay, good, good, good. So I think I'll leave it there and I wish you the best. Bye. Yes, Dr. Stephen, over to you. No, uh, please let Ali, Ali take it first. Thank you. I'm afraid Dr. Ali is not around, so would you like to add anything? Dr. Stephen, am I audible to you right now? Yeah, yeah. so th th thank you for the opportunity again. So in terms of uh, policy interventions, I think that uh, one of the critical policy directions we should be looking at is policies ref uh, with reference to sustainable financing of CSA uh, social technical innovations. We should have policies that addresses how we can sustainably finance our various efforts in, in pushing CSA, appropriate CSA uh, uh, social technical innovations. In the absence of that, then it becomes very, very, very difficult to, to scale into uh, sustainably maintain. So, uh, I think that we, if we are developing policy, we need a lot of advocacy towards financing uh, sustainably various CSA innovations. In terms of capacity, uh, capacity needs, I think that uh, one of the things that is very critical is climate information. Uh, climate information services is, is very critical in this regard because we need to help the smallholder farmer in making decisions to minimize climate risk. Today, we know one of the critical conditions, we have drought in, in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, both uh, late, late uh, early cessation of rains or uh, late onset of rains, intermittent dry spells within the cropping season. So these are very critical issues farmers have to deal with in sub-Saharan Africa. So making available climate information services that to help the smallholder make the right decision in as, in as to how to undertake various farm operations is very critical. So that, that means that in terms of capacitation, uh, enhancing access of climate information services is, is very critical in this regard. Thank you. I have another comment. Uh, for the capacity of building of the farmers uh, through training and educational discussion about the climate smart agricultural techniques and approaches. And uh, I think the extension, extension services, information system and crop of the livestock suitability mapping, they have to have uh, training uh, 
on ground for the farmers and the extension uh, services specialists that they, they will receive a training before adding knowledge to the farmers on their farms. Thank you, Dr. Maran. One of our participants has a question to make. Over to you, Dr. Sai. Hello, everybody. I'm Shafala Bhatti. Yes. Uh, I would like. Uh, I, I have a question uh, regarding uh, big data. And, uh, I think uh, Dr. Stephen will uh, respond well. I will. Uh, I would like to say uh, that how. What is the significance of big data uh, in terms of uh, in terms of supply chain and uh, uh, it has supply chain. And and the, the, the food food insecurity in the era of climate change. Uh, what does it to, to play a role uh, in food insecurity? And another thing is, and uh, with big data, uh, there is another Internet of Things uh, early warning early warning system of uh, unpredictable weather conditions. So, uh, Doctor uh, Stephen Yoba, can please uh, shed some light. Yeah, Th thank you, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I got all, all the, all the part of your question right. But I heard you talk about the data hub and then its uh, role in food security. Is that is that right? Yes, uh, uh, yes, Doctor Shivan. I want to ask, uh, what is the role of big data? Uh, how it helps uh, to uh, to tackle the food insecurity? Uh, big data. If you yeah. Have, so you use yeah, so, prediction of early uh, early warning system of weather weather patterns or other supply chains. Uh, yeah. How it works. Okay. Th th thank you. That is very clear now. So the data hub is very very critical in 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 achieving food security in the sense that. The, the, the data hub and the information it provides helps in the early warning systems. It helps provide uh, early warning systems and then helps provide information, predict, forecast, so people can make the right decisions. And this helps, all these are uh, under, underpinning factors to achieving uh, sustainable food security. So the Ag Data Hub is a repository of information that can be used in making predictions. It's a repository of information that can be used in forecasting, in developing early warning systems for countries and for, for regions. And therefore it helps and enhances the food security of households and at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Now I would like to invite Dr. Huma for the concluding remarks. Over to you, Dr. Huma. Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Zara. So first I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for sharing their important knowledge and uh, their experience. And what I could understand is your organization covered a wide breadth of topics from the key steps involved in the project preparation to how to secure funding for the project to upstream of infrastructural issues such as policies, institutions, legislation, and regulatory frameworks and approaches. Uh, I would also like to thank all the participants who have attended the training. Uh, um, uh, this webinar raised pertinent question that incited the discussion. And I believe that enabling environment and institutional partnerships are vital for achieving this industry driven, uh, industry four driven uh, climate smart agriculture. Um, this will uh, definitely require multi sectoral and I believe in uh, inter ministerial uh, approaches and collaboration, involving uh, all key stakeholders, including farmer organizations and uh, um, Agro industries, uh, academics, uh, policymakers, so for planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of uh, 
climate smart infrastructure. And this is a challenging process, given the wide array of uh, disciplines, actors, and frameworks that are relevant to climate smart agriculture, and the complex relationships between the industry core and uh, uh, climate smart agriculture. So, what concerts and concert center for climate uh, uh, and sustainability, uh, concert center for climate and sustainability? Uh, we are intend to promote multi-stakeholder dialogues to identify the opportunities and partnerships. Uh, between the, the organizations uh, with the same mandate and jointly address the gaps and harmonize the plans that are already uh, uh, operationalized uh, by these organizations. So um, we are uh, looking forward to have a continued collaboration post this event too. Uh, we will definitely have a follow-up with all of you, including the speakers and the participants. Uh, thank you once again for joining us for taking uh, out uh, time from your busy schedule, uh, especially Director General Ricardo, uh, Dr. Stephen, uh, Dr. Zitone, Dr. Maram, Dr. Ismail. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again, inshallah. Thank so, you. I thank you, Kamsat, for, for thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, so you for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a pleasure evening. I only request you to turn on your camera so that we can have a good photograph. Thank you. Uh, please, I would like to all to turn on your cameras. Okay. And I will look forward. So, right now we have 35 participants at the moment. Let's wait for, for a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all. Thank you so much. It was very informative. See you.